Hello, everyone. Welcome to Transmission, the show here on FreightWave TV. My name is Sebastian Blanco. Over there is my co-host, Grace Sharkey. Grace, how are you doing today? I am doing good. Uh, it's been a really fun week in transportation and, and got to talk to a lot of fun individuals on the editorial side. So uh, a great week so far. How are you doing? I'm, it has been a great week, especially uh, for those people who are interested in electric vehicles, because I can't talk about it very much until next week. But yesterday, I got to go to the Ford Proving Grounds and check out the all-electric F-150 Lightning, which... Like I said, I can't say anything in detail about it, but um, it's, you know, they're starting to talk about it, and I know a lot of people are excited about it, and now I understand where that excitement comes from. So that's the thing just about electric vehicles in general. We are going to talk about uh, the automotive supply chain and partially in how it relates to electric vehicles here today. Um, before we get started, uh, let me just remind people that we do this show this is the video and the podcast version. We also have a transmission newsletter, which covers similar topics, sometimes gets into a little more detail about what we talk to our guests about or sometimes previews them. So go to FreightWaves.com and look for the uh, transmission newsletter. S sign up for that. And then in the newsletter, we'll tell people to describe to, to subscribe to the show because, you know, we got to have that sort of cross-subscribing cross going on. Um, but yeah, before we, before we get to our guest today, I'd like to uh, hear a word from our sponsor. When you switch to AIT Worldwide Logistics for automotive shipping, you're partnering with a team of logistics professionals in Asia, Europe, and North America who develop customized supply chain solutions that are just as unique as your business, whether it's transborder, hotshot trucking, express ocean service, or an exclusive air charter, AIT has the expertise, technology, and carrier connections to achieve your production goals every time. Check out their link in the show notes. All right, so now we get started with the show proper. Our guest today is Dan Hirsch. He is with Alex Partners. Dan, how are you doing today? And I believe you're also in Michigan, correct? I am, yeah, doing fantastic. Uh, great to talk to you guys. Yeah, I'm in the uh, Detroit suburbs, uh, just outside of the city. Excellent, excellent. Well. As much as we'd like to talk about the nice weather in Michigan right now, we're actually obviously focused on the automotive supply chain. Before we get started with some of the, the questions we had for you, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do as, as far as looking at the supply chain and just sort of give us a little bit of a background on where you're coming from. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so, you know, born and raised here in Detroit. I've uh, worked in automotive pretty much my whole life, uh, you know, in turn with GM. I've worked for a number of the auto suppliers. Uh, and then as a consultant, I worked for uh, an engineering consultancy in a strategy role. Um, and then I've been with Alex Partners about nine years. My focus has really been on supply chain purchasing and manufacturing throughout that entire time. Uh, and at Alex Partners, I co-lead our automotive and industrials practice, as well as our, our sourcing and procurement transformation practice. So I'm right at the intersection of those two uh, those two things is where I do most of my work. Most of my work. Fascinating. And the how much have you have you looked at sort of or as part of all this analysis and investigation? Do you have you seen a lot of changes coming in with the electric vehicles? Has that been part of your focus as well, or are you just sort of more the broader automotive supply chain? Um, well, yeah, I mean all of that, right? So we do uh, we do look at uh, the significant changes coming to the ecosystem with what we call CASE, right, which is con connectivity, autonomy, sharing, and electrification. Those are all having impacts to the way cars are designed, the way they're going to be used, the way they're going to be owned. And then on the topic of today, particularly electrification, autonomy, and connectivity is driving the, the digitalization, the computerization of vehicles uh, in a very significant way. You know, near term, uh, more electrification means more control systems, more inverters and converters. Autonomy has a lot of processing power that you're adding in uh, what is currently a very decentralized way, right? So each of the little components, each of the subsystems that we bolt on to add ability tends to come with its own computer, with its own processors, with its own subsystems that then interface. Um, you know, in the future, the goal will be to get to a more um, centralized processing, uh, integrated set of systems to achieve the same goal. But we're a ways off on that. And, and in the meantime, it's a very, very significant increase in the usage of these, these particular devices that 
are top of mind for everyone because of the price. Yeah. Right. Um, so that, that brings me to our first sort of official question here. I know that Alex Partners has a thing called the Disruption Index, and it sounds like what you're talking about, obviously with the case things, but also just changing, you know, going to a more centralized format within the vehicle architecture instead of just having, you know, uh, semiconductors and little, little microcomputers in all of the different sensors. It's, you know, I know a lot of the suppliers are talking about, well, if we put this all into a unit that sort of handles that part of the, the car instead of a bunch of little units that, that are independent. Um, is that the kind of thing that the disruption index looks at or is it, is, is, well, I guess that, that almost has to be by definition because it's changing things. But tell me a bit about the disruption index and, you know, who, who might win and who might lose as things get disrupted even more in the coming years. Now, we'll get to the chip shortage and the pandemic and stuff in a second, but this is just sort of general trends in the industry. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the disruption index is, is much more um, industry agnostic, right? It looks, at, it looks at the ecosystem generally. I think if we think about the disruption index in terms of the automotive space, you're, you're spot on with um, all of the changes that are, are coming all at once. It's, uh, it's unprecedented, it, the, this rate of change, the types of changes, the entirety of the vehicle, how much of the content of the vehicle is changing uh, in parallel. And, and what's really interesting when we, again, we talk about those four things that, that make up that case uh, ecosystem, they're all uh, benefiting each other. You know, the more connectivity you have, yeah. the easier sharing and autonomy is. Uh, and, and those enable, uh, they make the electrification more valuable, right? If the car can drive itself, we have a car, the cars that are driving themselves and we're using them more as transportation, as a service, well, electrification becomes uh, infinitely more valuable in that sense. You know, range anxiety becomes less of a problem. There are all kinds of things that come together. Autonomy today is uh, accomplished by making the vehicle uh, almost like what we think of as a, a robot. You know, it, it has to be self-aware. It has to know what's going on. It has to, to react to things. As we improve connectivity, uh, it's the democratization of that. It we can take out a lot of censoring because the car can then communicate with the, the grid, the infrastructure, it can communicate with other vehicles. It can, it can recognize the location of pedestrians and other people through their devices and their uh, connectivity. And so it reduces the cost. Uh, it creates a, a, a much more of a system that the vehicle can live in rather than, you know, what we have the next few years and really probably a couple of decades is vehicles that have to uh, account for everything, right? They have to be aware and, of what's coming and what's likely to come. Um, but further down the road, that's where we get to uh, the vehicle integrated to not just not just the system, but to society in a way that's very different than today. That's what I think that's the kind of thing the disruption index is talking about in terms of both the short term and then the longer term. How, where are we going and how much of, of this is happening along? The that's all great, Dan. And I, well when you when you touch on change and disruption and, and especially this wave of it right that just almost uh in a tsunami form came out of nowhere um really the one thing that i'm seeing across the board for all supply chains right now is is the resilience right the ability to take on this change at any moment in time and and for the change in behaviors of uh, vehicle owners, uh, right? This is, these are all things that they want. How are you, um, helping these companies? How are you consulting, um, automakers with creating a more resilient supply chain? And is there a need for a complete change of how it's, how supply chain partners and, and tiers are working together now in order to achieve, um, this more electric and case future? Yeah. Um, so what I would tell you is um, case and electrification and all of the things that we just talked about in and of themselves don't necessarily change uh, the way that automakers need to work or partner with their suppliers and their partners. But 
what we have found from the pandemic, from when COVID hit early. Well, it was just a China problem at first, right? We were in yeah. February last year. We heard about these issues. Um, there were plants shut down coming out of Lunar New Year, which is a, which is kind of a normal period of, of stress for the, the global supply chain because there's two weeks where you really can't expect to, to get anything, any kind of reaction out of, out of plants in China. And so we all plan for that. Well, this kind of stretched that out. And at first it was only going to be a week and then it was 10 days. And then we started to realize, boy, this isn't just a China problem. And it wasn't more than a month later that now we're shutting down plants in Europe. Now we're shutting down plants in, in North America. So what was originally a kind of a part agnostic, every part coming from China and, and every type of part really does come in, in one degree or another from Asia, that disruption caused, um, you know, temporary shutdown at suppliers and automakers, but they were, they were small, they were isolated, they were somewhat recoverable through air freight. When the automakers in Europe and the U.S. and, up, and really everywhere had to shut down in, in April, May, sometimes into June, what happens is with that uncertainty of when it might end, uh, all the companies stopped ordering. They said, oh, let's Okay, we, we run very lean supply chains in automotive. We don't keep inventory more than a few days at a plant. We don't keep more than four to six weeks in the ordering cycle, firm orders to a supplier that they can count on. Mm -hmm. We do provide forecasts, but the forecasts are subject to change outside of that. And so when you talk about resiliency to a two-month shutdown of orders, for many products, we have, the, you know, they're, they're more generic, they're more, there's more general supply, there's more fungibility of material that those supply chains could recover. These semiconductors, once they're made into a chip, and really even once the wafer is made and cut and etched, now they can't be turned into something else. And that's where the difficulty really came up. So there, there was uh, there was an issue going into the pandemic, even even in 2019. Generally, supply was tight. Right, the fabs, the, the places where they make the the actual wafers. You know, they grow a big crystal, a big cylinder, and then they cut it into flat uh, pieces, and then they cut those into little squares and they stack that up. You know, that that's the process of making the chip. Those companies were already running at or above you know, kind of their normal capacity. So there wasn't, there was already kind of in shortage, not crisis shortage, just everybody had to really be, be, uh, be uh, clear with their needs, order ahead. And so the supply chain was working. Once you turn everything on and then try to turn it back on, well, you end up, you know, you think of the supply chain like a pipe, well, you've created a bubble. And once that bubble hits a certain point, it, the pipe's empty, and now the water won't flow. So now you have to fill the pipe back up. Well, that, in this case, takes a few months. And so, you know, uh, this, when, in supply chain, we talk about uh, the bullwhip effect. This is something everybody learns about in an op operations class in school uh, when you study this. And you think of it as, you know, when I crack a whip, my hand only moves a little bit. The end of that whip moves many feet. And the same thing happens. My little... My, my small perturbation, as it works its way down the supply chain, causes big discontinuities at multiple points. And so the wafer makers, the semiconductor manufacturing, the companies that make the substrate, which is kind of a plastic material that, that is part of the chip making, uh, different, different parts of that value chain all saw, you know, the bubble pass by them and their their uh, supply chains were empty and then they had to fill it back up. So what we're seeing starting kind of at the end of last year into this year is the, that bubble hitting us. And right now we're kind of at the peak, right? Mm -hmm. kind of, this is, if you count it in number of vehicles not being built, that plan, which is how we're measuring it, we're at, we're at what is the next couple of weeks is going to be the worst part, right? So what is what did happen was most of the automakers and suppliers recognized the problem, saw it coming in Q4 last year, so November, December, refilled their orders, 
but then you've got a six month time frame yeah. to refill all those orders. Well, we're coming up on six months. So now those those orders are starting to show up as chips at auto suppliers and auto suppliers are starting to make them into, into parts that go to automakers. But it will take you know, another six, eight, 10 weeks. And one additional problem that we have with the pandemic is uh, if, if we weren't in the pandemic, we would have lots and lots and lots of air travel going on. That, right? You, we'd be taking vacations. We'd have business travel. Yeah. We'd have all of these planes flying all over. And so in an emergency, my normal play might be to get everything made and then fly it instead of putting it on a, an ocean line. Yeah. The planes aren't there. I can't. I can't get a plane coming from China to the United States. I can't get a plane coming from India to the United States almost under any circumstance mm -hmm. at the current time. Mm -hmm. And so my normal expedite <laughs> levers are taken away. Um, and so there's all of all of those things, right? So we talked talked about the supply constraint, everything being tight. What that what happens in that situation is all of these additional little things. That it's the shock absorbers, the cartilage in your knee, right? It, it, instead of being able to absorb and recover, everything is just hitting and hitting and hitting. And each one of these ends up with another missed shipment, another missed vehicle, another plant shutdown, all of it. And that's what we're feeling. You know, I think it was last week, it was approximately 280,000 vehicles were expected to be made somewhere in a plant on earth weren't made because the plant was shut down because some part isn't there. And it's not all the parts aren't there. It's one or two or maybe 10, it's uh, impossible to think. But you need every part <laughs> to make the vehicle yeah. or else you can't sell the vehicle. And so that's that's the complexity that we're talking about here. You know, you think of the, the thousands of parts that go into a vehicle, nine, 10, something like 15,000 parts. Um, and it's, you've got to have them all and you got to have all the right ones. And with all of the different technologies, all of the different options, all of the different colors, these all come together to create this type of problem. The good thing for the automotive industry has been there was a lot of inventory, so our sales have remained strong, but right now we are well below normal level to the point where continued shortage of production is going to lead to a shortage of sales. Uh, and that is, so it's going to take some time to not only make the cars that are needed for sale to consumers, but also fill up the inventories to a more uh, comfortable level. I will, I got two, two quick notes here. I, I love one of the sort of, um, you know, you said you, you need all the parts to build the car and that is true, but I can't remember now if it's Peugeot or Citroen, but one, one company over in Europe decided to change the digital speedometer in one of the cars they're building over to an old school analog one because it would require fewer or maybe no semiconductor chips. So they're at least like, well, in this one way, we can save a couple of chips and use them in other parts of the car. So that's that, that's yeah. a clever solution to this, but not you can't it do is, that yeah. for most things. I mean, that's just a very special situation. One thing that kind of surprised me at what you said was that you're sort of saying this is the peak right now. I know I've seen estimates that the chip shortage could be affecting us all the way into 2023. Um, mm -hmm. Do you just totally disagree with that long of a time frame? Or no, is, no. you know, are you giving a shorter timeline because you, you see really positive things happening that maybe others don't. No, I'm, I'm, uh, I'll differentiate between the crisis that we're in and a shortage. The shortage has been, has been known and in place really since 2019, right? And so to get, to get a little more detailed, uh, you also have to think of, there, there are a couple of dynamics with these semiconductors and the way that they're made. And starting at the fab, which is where they grow the, the crystal, there are, there are a couple of, call them form factors or standards. And we talk about them in terms of 200 millimeter, which is eight inches, and 300 millimeter, which is 12 inches. The more conventional, older technology, last generation chips that, are, that have larger nodes, and we talk about those in terms of, you know, 30 to 70 nanometer, you know, how they etch the, the, uh, the lines on the chip. Those are made on older technology, 200 millimeter um, uh, size weights. Right? That's what automotive is primarily using. The 300 millimeter is, is not reserved for, but most of the development has been for the higher performance, higher powered 
chips that are not as much insured. Um, and so nobody's investing in new machinery, new tooling, new fabs to make 200 millimeter wafers, right? And so why automotive is, is being hit so hard is the shortage on that type of wafer um, will take some time to a redesign chip so they can be made on the 300 millimeter wafers, um, redesign parts that can take advantage of different chips, but then also adding capacity, which what comes in the form of new fabs and running fabs faster. That takes months and, and a couple of years. So when we talk about the shortage, it's adding capacity to the entire market, which you know a lot of that has been announced. Companies are announcing building fabs in Arizona and all, all, all these different places. You know, some localization is naturally going to happen. Um, not be, you know, this, this is not a problem that happened because it's a long supply chain, right? That's a little bit coincidental to the issue. Um, the same, the problem would have been similar if these fabs were sitting in the U.S. as well. Um, growing a crystal takes months. There, and there's, there are only a few things you can do to speed that up, and they're not all good. Right? They, they wear on the equipment add mm -hmm. cost, they reduce yield, there's all kinds of problems. And so when I say the shortage will, and I would say the crisis will, the fact that I that automakers can't get any of the parts that they need of certain type, that will be alleviated. And we expect to see auto plants running at, at capacity and maybe a bit of overtime at the end of this year. Overall, there will not be enough capacity to make all of the demand for auto and consumer goods and electronic and, and cloud computing and Bitcoin mining and all of those other things that are that are bigger users. One important thing to note, automotive is maybe seven to 10 percent of the global market for this material. So where it, for, for many other materials that are typical for automotive, automotive swings a big hammer. Not the case with semiconductors. Right. It's not we're, mm -hmm. we're not a big user in relative terms. Now, one of the things that I've heard people talk about and I've talked about it in the past is not only did we have the, the shutdown and stopped ordering, but consumer electronics got very hot at the same time. Mm -hmm. That didn't help, but it is also didn't really cause the problem. Right. Though the majority of the chips that this company is using iPhones and displays and, and Big computers. Those are the more advanced, higher power chips that are made on, you know, the 300 millimeter fabs. Um, there is some overlap, but it's not the significant driver. The significant driver was the the bullwhip effect. It continues to be the bullwhip effect. It's about catching up the orders that were placed and then building the cars once we get the part there. And that's why I say late this year, automakers should be able to uh, make enough cars to get the refill inventory going into next year but it is true that it's going to take until 2023 and really longer because it takes a couple of years to build the fab and start it up it takes another year to really get it humming and so you know to, to be building at full capacity i think where companies need to be concerned is if all of the the plants all of the fabs all of the capacity that's being talked about right now is added we're going to end up in a supply glut and prices are going to fall for these semiconductors, which is great for automakers, but not good for semiconductors. These are not good for the boundaries, the, the, the companies making the wafers and the silicon chips. So disruption index, right? Who gets disrupted is not is not all equal at the same time. One man's you know trash is another man's treasure. It's uh it, I I have a personal debate right now between one of our editorial writers on whether nearshoring is going to happen or not. So I will say you have heard my argument on that one a little bit there. <laughs> but uh, well, yeah, near, nearshoring has been happening. Um, you know, absent this, uh, you know, a couple of things. China's got more expensive from a labor standpoint. Um, China is also a lot of the capacity that used to exist there that was that was really just for the global market is now being uh, used by the, the Chinese market, right? Yeah. That the consumer market there has grown as a result. And so when you consider the additional risk, the additional cost of transportation, uh, the relative increase in labor costs, 
um, yeah, near sharing, near, near shoring and localization to countries like Mexico or, or South America, for the United States, uh, for North Africa or Europe starts to make a lot more sense. And, you know, the, the trade data, if you look at the trade data, it supports that there has been a shift out of China to what we call a China plus strategy, still a lot of Asia, but moving significantly uh, to uh, more local areas and not just because of USMCA and other uh, their trade agreements, but because the fundamentals uh, support the uh, financial position. Uh, you mentioned something about the investment in the newer chips uh, being lower. Do you think that auto, because they have such a small share of that, do you think that they're just going to kind of ride it out and wait for that disruption to come basically to a point where they can become more accessible and not cause harm to their supply chain? Or do you see them investing in um, this technology themselves directly and maybe investing in different um, uh, companies, whether it's in China or here, in order to make that uh, type of chip more accessible to them? Yeah, um, I think some companies will vertically integrate to some degree. Right, you already see this, uh, you know, you guys like to talk about EVs a lot. You're seeing this with uh, companies making their own batteries, right? Good example. They see, they right. see that piece as a competitive advantage. Semiconductors, you'll probably see a little bit of that, um, but it's not going to be the case that uh, the automakers try and have a secured supply for all of the chips. What they may do uh, and what, you know, some automakers have done in the past is own that capability so that they understand it better, right? Mm -hmm. They don't want to make all their chips, but if they make some, they understand the supply and demand dynamics. They understand the technical. They'll understand their their supplier's business much better. Um, you know, the trend in the last 15 years in automotive has been uh, outsourcing and not, not just offshoring, but just getting the businesses, you know, Ford and GM, they used to make their own seats. They used to make their own IPs. They used to, a lot of what they, they used to do, uh, they made an internal division. Um, they spun those off in the, the late 90s, early 2000s, right? They created separate companies for that purpose. Um, and those were probably good decisions for the most part. Uh, there's a lot of nuance to, to what each got out of that. But they also have started to pull some of that back because they recognize that they outsourced the capability, but also the expertise. And now internally, they didn't really know as much about what what the design choice is and what the cost is. And so I definitely see companies starting to do that more. But I also see them making the investment, not in companies, but in the effort to move their, um, move the chip, you know, the, the chip may be this, this little tiny thing that typically has been made on a 200 millimeter fab, but Making it on a 300 millimeter fab is more efficient in the set in the pure geometric sense of I have a circle this big or I have a circle this big. I can use all of the interior of the circle to cut out little squares, except there's something around the edge. Well, the relative portion of the circle that gets mm -hmm. wasted at the edge is much smaller on a 300 millimeter uh, wafer or a 300 millimeter disc, and so there are you know pure operational financial benefits, but it takes engineering and tooling money to make those design changes and making design changes in automotive is not something that we do right we make when we make changes it involves a lot of testing to make sure that um, it's safe it works doesn't interact with some other part of the vehicle unexpectedly and automakers have gotten very good at that over the past few years but there have been some very failures to do so and we get reminded of that every once in a while um and that that serves to get us back on track <laughs> doing the right things and so companies will do this cautiously they'll do it the right way but there are th this will serve as an impetus to get automakers to, to spend that money because um it wouldn't just be enough to get to 300 millimeter uh wafers just on those financials that i described but Given the capacity, given the move of the industry to those uh, form factors, it makes a lot. 
Excellent. Well, Dan, thank you so much for joining us today. We have unfortunately run out of time. Um, I can tell just from your answers, you could, you could keep going on this for a long time. So hopefully we'll have you back at some point in the future. Um, thank you so much. That was Dan Hirsch, Managing Director at Alex Partners. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Okay. Thanks, Sebastian. Thanks, Grace. And uh, just a reminder for listeners, again, uh, go over to FreightWaves.com, look up the transmission newsletter, sign up there, tell your friends to sign up here as well. Um, we will talk to you next week.